All right, so let's see if we can get a little bit more of this um, out, and we're still on the subject matter and on the topic matter of um, um, our Ethiopian Commonwealth. We can also call it our divine, for us here in the West, our divine uh, heritage, and we thank um, the messenger of his majesty to us in the diaspora, Dr. Malakwa Emmanuel Bayan, of the Ethiopian World Federation for helping to um, establish, you understand, and, 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 and sacrificing a sense his life as, as an Ethiopian martyr, you understand, to get that truth to us here in the wilderness of North America and the diaspora. So we um, give thanks and praise to the God and Father of our Black Lord and Savior, Jesus Christos, for Dr. Malako Emmanuel Bayan. Now, when we're speaking about Amhara, as a tribe. So Amhara is a Sultane. This is the point to understand. And those who might not understand what we mean, we say, well, His Majesty Amhara and he has Ottoman blood. Well, it's because of the basic fact that Amhara is not a tribe in the sense of a Gosha, a Gosha, a Gosha, as you say tribe, in the sense of a Neged, you understand, know like Neged, like Moa Andesa, Zaim, Negeda, Yehuda. Well, yes, it's a tribe. But see, now that tribe also has a spiritual and a metaphysical identity to it. You understand? So this is where when we talk about the Kala Kidan, the Kala Kidan of that ancient covenant of the Q of S or the Queen of Sheba, you understand, who was of Tigray. It's the Tigray that are responsible for the, the imperial script of Ethiopia, or what we call the national script. But in today's politics, Many of the Tigray or Tigra, Tigrayans, and many of the Amharas and the Ottomans, they're, they're all at war in a sense, a kind of a covert war in a sense, and somewhat overt at times, you understand, but there's this bickering among the different groups which really is threatening because a house divided cannot really stand, and the Europeans and the enemies of um, of Holy Ethiopia understand that and know that. And there's many attempts that we can see historically against that al Kidan, that covenant society and culture, even though they may have great admiration and, and acknowledge its ancientcy and, and the, the claims being true. And this is what we find, that the older documents and other documents acknowledge is true, and then some of them later on would then put out little scurrious kind of information, and then this information is picked up by others, you know, and then it becomes popular because people don't study, study this for themselves. And this is very important that we study um, who we are, our identity. Now, for us as a diaspora, we identify as being Ethiopian without apology, you know, saying, but there is documentation, facts, and evidence that one needs to understand and know and be acquainted with, you know, saying, so that that acknowledgement, you know, saying, or that that faith is a true faith and it's, and it's based on truth and reality. So this is why we seek to study, this is why we seek to share these studies with others who might be and hopefully are so interested. But here's another book, a book called Tribes. We talked about it before, you know, saying, we talked about it before, this book called Tribes, right? And this book called Tribes by someone named Joel Kotkin. I think this is him right here. He's, he's basically talking about how tribes, you understand, how, about how tribes, he says how race, religion, and identity determine success in the new global economy. Let me just repeat this. How race, religion, and identity determine success in the new global economy. That's the, that's the subtitle. The main title is Tribes. Now, this book... Um, we got some years ago, and we found to be very, very interesting. And even though it mainly is talking about um, um, non-black peoples, there is some allusion and some mention of black people in the very beginning part of it and certain of the black movements that is very interesting and in their analysis, for example, of in the prologue especially, it speaks about... Um, um, down here, in this respect, the history and development of global tribes is particularly enlightening. Clearly identifiable values, such as a strong ethnic identity, a belief in self-help, hard work, thrift, education, and the family, 
have proved universally successful in all these different groups, stripped of the burden of Cold War ideology and racism. Now, we have to remember that what happened to Imperial Ethiopia, the creeping coup, the Satanistic Illuminati um, New World Order coup against Imperial Ethiopia, had a lot to do with the Cold War. The Cold War becomes the cover for what was done against the elect of God and the great transgression in Ethiopia. So the burdens of Cold War ideology and racism, the relationship between such values and group success is simply too self-evident to ignore. In other words, it says that there's a relationship between such values, groups that keep certain values, and, 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 and group success is simply too evident to ignore. In other words, there's so much evidence out there to ignore it is, is plainly stupid and foolish. But here, in this paragraph coming up, he says, this perspective already has produced, among other things, a critical debate among groups such as African Americans. So in, on page 10 of this book, he includes us, you understand, in a basic uh, analysis, you know, and he quotes Proverbs 22 and 29. Seest thou a man diligent in his business? He shall stand before kings, Proverbs 22, 29. So he's very diligent in, in giving us a, a kind of a paragraph here and there. But here in the earliest part, he says, this perspective already has produced, among other things, a critical debate among groups such as African Americans. In contrast to the legalistic, civil rights-oriented or oriented traditions, of the black establishment, and they're talking about the boule, the black establishment, right? African American leaders, as different in temperament and approach as Booker T. Washington, Marcus Garvey, Malcolm X, Louis Farrakhan, and Tony Brown. That's that's a that's a that's a, a positive brother there, Tony Brown, have emphasized the importance of developing a more self-affirming economically and intellectually self-sufficient social culture as the primary means of overcoming racial oppression. And that's something very, very important. Now, the author is not going back to some of the older, I call it the Ethiopianism and Ethiopianist traditions, where on the spiritual level, black people being able to read the Bible and recognize the experience being told in the Bible, identify themselves both with Ethiopia in the racial type of black as well as in Africa, as well as with Israel in our position in the world and our experience in the world. And therefore identifying now with that Beta Israel of the Bible was a way that we, in a sense, even unconsciously were identifying ourselves. Because white man was saying it was nigga, 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 but the true preachers, the preachers that didn't have to get licenses, we're talking about the real preachers, the original Negro spiritual preachers didn't get licenses. They brought all that licensing for preacher so that the slave master, you understand, could give the slaves you understand, and the semi-slaves, when they went to sharecropping, give them preachers after their own choosing, you understand, who would reinforce white supremacist, um, pseudo-Christian or anti-Christ values, which sought to stop the rise of the black Messiah. So that's important to understand. So we highlighted that part right there because it's very important, the importance of developing a more self-affirming, economically and intellectually self-sufficient social structure, social culture, excuse me, social culture as the primary means of overcoming racial oppression. You know what I'm saying? And we can apply the principle here that Joe Kotkin in his tribes, how race, religion, and identity determine success in the new global economy with the Ethiopian commonwealth. You understand? With this Ethiopian commonwealth, where we have, where it says the importance of developing a more self-affirming. So instead of th these groups coming together, affirming that they are Tigram Hara Oromo, 
they were affirming that they are Ethiopian. You understand that they are Ethiopian, that they are citizens in this al Kidan. you understand, a covenant, Bible, God's covenant, you understand, based um, commonwealth. So they all identified with what we can call the national script or the imperial script, which is the Kibbutz and the Guest. You understand? And when we look even in the Bible, there's a lot of people mention the Bible along with the Beta, Beta Israel, who it's clear they were not so-called um, Israelites from Jacob in that sense, but they were part of this Israelitish commonwealth. You understand? And they lived as much as possible according to the laws of Torah and the al Kidan and the covenant, so forth and so on. So they all were, even though it may say so-and-so from such and such, or so and so, the such and such, and you look up such and such, and it doesn't come back to Israel, means that it was another tribe, another another group of people. You'll know send that identified more with the the spiritual ideal. So there's two things working together. You understand? There is the the ethnic racial. You understand? Group. That means the seed type. That seed group. That's the core part. That's what we can call the royal family, you understand? Um, and then there is the greater aspect who, through faith, you understand, come into a covenant with this God-blessed chosen people. It's like Israel. There's a racial Israel, a real Israel, which we identify and claim is that black, is that remnant of the true lost, once lost but now found black sheep, what we identify as Ethiopian Hebrews. And then there are other peoples, Gentiles, other races, other nationalities coming from other diverse backgrounds who identify with the, the, the faith base, you understand, who, who now become a part of this commonwealth, not through the blood type, but through the faith type. And according to the Almighty, that is even preferred in those who do even have a place better than the sons and the daughters, almost like Ruth in the story in the Bible, Herut. And we did a, a treatment, a commentary of Ruth that is also available. Check us out on www.lojsociety.org. But Ruth is best known for leaving her people, you understand, know behind and joining herself to her mother-in-law, to, to Naomi, you understand, know and saying that her God becomes Naomi's God becomes her God, her people becomes her people, and they are one people, and and that is such a a an example of what we have also within this paradigm here. You understand know of true Ethiopia. You understand know which the enemy has been working day and night, year in year out to di to divide and conquer and destroy this. You understand? Because the enemy know that this is what brings in the kingdom of God. You understand? This is what brings in what we can say is the tangible, the foundation, the, 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 the base, the base of the kingdom, the base or the root, when it says the root, the yesod, you understand, which helps to establish the malkut. You understand? So he's seeking to destroy it, you understand, from its root. You understand, but remember, you cannot, as Barhana Selassie, Bob Marley said, 3,000 years of history cannot be wiped away so easily. You understand? So we have to get to work to preserve what we can preserve. So the Amhara is not a tribe, and the Amhara is, in truth, a sultani. That's why one can be Amhara, you understand, and have Oromo blood. In other words, have someone in their direct lineage or family who could be identified and would be identified with a particular tribal stock of people, but they still are part of this Ethiopian commonwealth whose national script is the Kibber Neges, the national script. Now, see, what Ethiopia did, the careless Ethiopians did in 1974 and 75, has um, presented a sort of a mesonaco, you understand, a mesonaco, a stumbling block, an obstacle to them. Because by the creeping coup, by the um, great transgression, the rebellion against the king of kings, 
not only did they so-called throw out the monarchy or turn their backs on the monarchy and dismantle the active functioning of the monarchy, but also they adversely affected the connective 3,000 years of history, not changing the fact that it exists, but changing their relationship with it and also running away from it, causing a lot of psychological and spiritual malfunctions and dis-ease, you understand, as well as on a purely practical, we could say even on the, the, the real level people call it real, affecting the economy of Ethiopia. Imagine how Ethiopia's economy, if that Afro-American link with Ethiopia and the Afro-Caribbean and Afro-Hispanic link with Ethiopia coming from the West was maintained, you understand, with a careful generation of Ethiopia, not a careless. Imagine how that would change the stability of Ethiopian economics, lift up the Ethiopian economy, help to also lift up other African countries. Therefore, the OAU or the AU today, peacekeeping, you understand? Those kind of issues would not be so daunting and challenging as they are today, and, and we wouldn't probably be seeing the worst famine they're saying that Ethiopia has experienced, they say, in about 60 years. They say 60 or 70. They keep going back and back and back to say how worse this particular famine that Ethiopia is experiencing. But remember Psalm 68, which says that the rebellious dwell in a dry land. They have rebelled for more than what, how long has it been? 30, almost 40 years. They rebelled. You understand against the Al Kidan, not even just against a man or a king, the emperor, Haile Selassie, but they rebelled against their God ordained covenant. Therefore, they are experiencing in a type the curses for disobedience, the very same curses that we and our people, the Falashes of the West, have experienced over the past 400 to some say 500 years. So, so this is what is very interesting and what needs to be understood. So in the same way as the author says the importance of developing a more self-affirming, to affirm well, who we are as an Ethiopian commonwealth, does the Ethiopian commonwealth include us as Afro-Americans? Well, of course it does. But if you were to speak to some um, postmodern, careless generation Ethiopians who, who have been um, told and taught and believe a lie, you understand, generally they are antagonistic to his majesty, the monarchy, and they do not even accept, you understand, the, the true claims of the Kibbutz anymore. Therefore, that's also affected Ethiopia's position in Africa, Ethiopia's position in the world, but more importantly, Ethiopia's position in the kingdom of God, you understand, but there's that faithful remnant. You understand, there's that faithful remnant both at home in Ethiopia and abroad in the diaspora whose prayers, you understand, day and night, you understand, and other acts of righteousness, you understand, are keeping, you could say, the holy aspect of Ethiopia alive. But, but it's, a, it's a real spiritual war, my brothers and sisters. You understand, it's, it's a real spiritual war. So here the author speaks about economics as well as being intellectually self-sufficient social culture where we don't have to depend on others to tell us who we are, you understand, but those of our own kind, you understand, who both in word and deed have our best interests at heart, feeding us, you understand, intellectually as well. But what's not addressed here that needs to be addressed, of course, is the spiritual aspect of culture, too. You understand? Is the, is the spiritual aspect. In fact, we also call them how to, a culture before we call it a tribe in the usual sense of tribe. In fact, we had mentioned this before, that when we say a tribe, because we always said, why do they define sometimes it as a tribe, sometimes as a nation? You know, different writers, different authors, and so we started to look up in the Ethiopic, the Gutters, and look up in the Amharic, trying to find the various different words that are used to describe 
tribe or this tribe uh, like a wagon. Um, you ha you have uh, uh, you know words to describe tribe and family and clan and this and that because different ones would use these different words. Like we've told that Africa has a lot of different tribes. Why don't they say that Africa has a lot of different nations? You see, that would make the true the true reality much more clear but the europeans don't want the africans to think that really they are of many different nations that have been called tribes to further divide and petty to make them seem petty in a sense because the yeah, tribe uses like if i'm a particular person and i have descendants who all come from me and they are proud that they are linked to me and i've done great things you understand? Then people would mix with them and support them and join their houses. You understand? To those houses and the, and that 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 root part of me who actually have the blood. You understand of me, and they would take on the characteristics of that group in that sense, and that group would be as their royal family in that sense. You understand? So that's how you have that tribe, that tribal idea. You understand? That's, that's where you can get that kind of a tribal idea, being descended all from one particular um, ancestor. You see, so that's when we say that the Automo, and we say the Automo in this sense is a tribe, is not to be little, but to really emphasize the Ilum Orma. In other words, the one name is Ilum Orma, because the Ilum Orma, they say, either means sons of uh, Orma and Orma might have been some hero, particular hero to them, but they haven't identified from any other sources, Automo or otherwise, anything else. Though there's certain stories and legends that are circulating, but there's nothing, there's no direct evidence. But we have direct evidence from the Bible that also links the Automo, you know what I'm saying, to this Solomonic Davidic group. But just remember that there are times of great closeness, and there's times of great distance amongst people. You know what I'm saying? What Ethiopia has experienced um, over the last 30 to 40 years, you have to remember that they removed the Misesa. By removing the monarchy, is like removing the Misesa. You know what I'm saying? And when you remove that, it also affects, there's also an adverse effect to the faith. Since we understand from the Kalakidan or the true Judeo, Christian or Hebreo Christian um, identity for those who are Ethiopian Jews or Ethiopian Christians that the monarchy links with the faith and that faith now links us with the patriarchs in a particular lineage, you understand? As well as it links us with a particular um, language. You see, so the heart became that language that blended the Tigray or Shemitic influences that brought with it this national script, the Queen of Sheba, her only son, Minulik, or the Kibber Neges, and the Oromos, you understand, or they would formally say the Gala, who also joined themselves, you understand, to this al Kidan group. You understand, and there's a, it's like when we say America, when one says America, that one is American. What makes these people American? Not because they all come from the same place, or they're the same tribe, or a similar tribe. Sometimes they're as different as so-called day and night. You understand? But they all identify with America. You understand? So it's certain ideals, certain ideas, whether so-called true or regarded as true by others or whether false, but they all affirm. You understand? They all affirm. Like in the Amhara idea, what's affirmed, first of all, is the language, the language of the realm. You understand? The language of the realm, which is Amharic. Now, Amharic is a type of a pidgin language, what they call pidgin or what they call also a patois, because it combines both Shemitic and Kemitic or Hamitic influences. This is why it's usually called, we call it a Kamo Shemitic, others may call it a Hamo Semitic language, but overall it's known as a Shemitic language. In fact, the Amharic language, they say, is um, second only globally spoken to... Um, I think they said, uh, what is it, Arabic. They said that the Amharic language is only second to Arabic. That means that the Amharic language is, in a sense, more spoken than the modern um, 
um, Euro European Jewish uh, fourth Hebrew, because that modern Hebrew, Hebrew Yiddish, and you know, in certain ways, certain the certain good things to what they did. But on next level, as far as a speech language, it shares more in common with the European Polish and German roots than it does with with true Hebrew. In order to get into true Hebrew, you have to get into the good is. The good is preserves the keys for the biblical Hebrew. And we're not the only ones to have, well, we're probably one of the few to say it, but many of the other linguists from ages gone by have often, when a questionable Hebrew word, they couldn't figure out what it meant, they resorted to Ethiopic or the Ethiopian language or the good is for evidence, and then when they went to the good is, they were able then to better trace it even in Syriac and other sort of languages. And in some of these older works, they actually give credit that they were able to discover the real meaning disclosed in the Ethiopic. In fact, even in some of these Kumashes, these uh, synagogue Taurus, there's some areas and some of the other um, uh, Tanakh books of the scriptures, the Hebrew Bible, where they actually talk about some words um, or Ethiopic words. They don't do it a whole lot, but in some places they're forced to because they have no other way of explicating, you understand, a true or accurate meaning other than going to the Ethiopic. You understand? So when they say Ethiopic is a dead language, um, that's a damn lie, basically. But they, they wish it. It's the part of their wish list. They wish it to be a dead language. So the Amharic or the Amahara is a blending you see, one time we might have called it, we as black people here in America, we might have called it even in a sense mulatto. You know what I mean? Or, you know, that's what we might have called that sort of mixing or blending of these two different groups, the Tigray from the north and the Oromo from the south meeting in the central, in the central part. Not just the central part of the country, as we mentioned, but also in a centrality, a blending of, of cultural influences where each one gave, you understand, of what it had to the whole, and they formed a unity. So when we say his majesty is Amhara and he has Oromo blood, that is just explaining that he is of this sultane, you understand? He is of this particular civilization or culture, you understand? And his roots, you understand, are... Oromo, you understand that he has Oromo roots, which means usually this would, even though people nowadays are, are more proud uh, to identify it, before people would just, they wouldn't think the way modern people do in this tribal, this postmodern age, because now people are almost crazy about this tribal thing, and forget that in order to live in the world, you understand? One has to find a way, if possible, to cooperate with other peoples. You understand? And that cooperation sometimes, the great things come through that cooperation. Each one can give of that which it had. You understand? And this is what we have in the, <coughs> the classical days. You understand? When the Tigray, Amhara, some call it, or the Amhara. What's interesting, too, is that many Tigray who refuse this, um, some of the Tigray wasn't as happy with this new culture coming out of the Central Highlands. And some of them disparage these Amharas by calling them Oromos, even though they were Tigra people who moved south. Some of them married Oromos, and they had families, and they came together in culture in the Sultani as a people. Some of the northerners, you know, and the Tigray, you know, and probably most likely being influenced by the uh, Middle Eastern or Arabian type, you know, and the, the old divide and conquer, called the Amharas as a way of derision, Galas, you know, saying, or Gala Amharas, you know, saying, as a way of throwing snipes at them. So this use of pejorative, we can find it on all sides, but the thing that we're looking at is we're looking at what is pure, what is positive, and therefore the Amhara in that sense, in its classical sense, represents what is best in our Ethiopian commonwealth as well as what we have, have been told um, concerning our divine heritage, you understand, our divine heritage. So this is 
this is just one example, and we hope that at least it might go to helping to reestablish uh, a context of discussion. You understand? That doesn't disclude anybody because we over here as Afro-Americans, we're not taking any, any sort of sides, but it may seem so because, like they say, the truth is an offense. So some believing lies when we bring out a truth that they think is a lie, but they haven't gone and, and checked out yet. They haven't gone and investigated it for themselves yet. Otherwise, they would say, well, I've gone and looked for it, and this is what I found, and that's not what you said, and then we can have a discussion or dialogue, but some don't want to have a discussion or dialogue. They are trying to destroy our Ethiopian commonwealth, even though nominally, in other words, in name, they might be Ethiopians as well, you understand, similar to what's going on in a lot of other places in the world. You understand, people call themselves of a certain group, but they're trying to destroy that group. You understand? They say some of these terrorist guys might be having American passports or homegrown in that sense. This idea of homegrown terrorists. So Ethiopia, in its classical state, is familiar with this sort of idea. You understand? So when the Europeans saw that, they sought to emphasize this negative. You understand? To emphasize this, this and this is something they've done everywhere the Europeans have had an idea to either subjugate or to um, take away the sovereignty of a people is to find these little differences between brother and brother, you understand, exaggerate it, you understand, emphasize it until the fabric of unity of the people became so weak that now him as an outside, as an outside force, you understand, could be seen as the unifier of it, and then he can put that civilization and culture under his belt. He hasn't been so successful with Ethiopia as, as of yet, because there's a lot that's still not known about Ethiopia. When we talk about 3,000 years, we really can talk about 10,000 or 13,000 years, but we first have to deal with these 3,000 years, you understand, in order to be able to deal with the Ten and thirteen thousand years. So we hope that this is um, that this is helpful. All right. So um, stay tuned and more to come. Shalom, Rastafari.